towers fell. We all know exactly where we were on 9-11, if we were alive. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to really not enjoy asking this. Do you know what year you were born? What year were you born? Are there any questions on literally anything before we get cranking? Perspective on what happened on the very ground that you are standing on and all the way down the street towards the World Trade Center site on what happened the day of and days, weeks, months, and years after 9-11. Military fighter jets zooming over the ground, lower than any aircraft I had ever seen. And that's when I realized something was up. The worst days in American history, the worst day in New York City history. At 8.46 a.m. Eastern, American Airlines Flight 11 strikes the North Tower between floors 93 and 99. Many people thought it was a small passenger plane, it was not. It was a jet. 9.03 a.m. Eastern, United Flight 175 strikes the South Tower. For 75 and 85 with the whole world watching on television. 9.37 a.m. Eastern, the Pentagon, a government building in Washington, D.C., is struck by American Airlines Flight 77. 9.59 a.m. Eastern, the South Tower, the second tower struck, is the first to collapse straight down. 10.03 a.m. Eastern, 10.03, United Flight 93 is crashed into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It is said the passengers realized what was happening. They overtook the hijackers forced them to crash the plane early into that empty field. It is said Flight 93 was destined for either the Capitol or the White House. And then at 10.28 a.m. Eastern, the North Tower, the first tower, struck as the second to collapse straight down, thus sending, at least in the immediacy, the carnage of 9-11. 2,977 victims died on 9-11. 2,977. Over 400 first responders, 343 firefighters. None will be forgotten. So, let's dive in. First, a quick vocabulary lesson. What movies or sitcoms have you watched with the money shot of the New York skyline, get that sun setting between the towers, and if you're gonna film here. So people came down here all the time to gaze at these pop culture icons. To give you a rough idea, that big tower, which we're totally blocked by right now, we'll talk more about it later, roughly the same height as the Twin Towers, is basically what it would look like. Just to the left of that down the road where those trees are is where the North Tower stood, and to the left of that is where the South Tower stood, and I'll show you their exact footprints Let's take a small walk down this way and get a better view of her from the back, and we'll continue. And this is the oldest public building in New York City. It was built in 66. 1766. So as you can imagine, she has seen quite a few things. A couple major New York City fires, a little ditty we had called the Revolutionary War. George Washington, when he was inaugurated our first president, came right here after the ceremony and prayed for the other founding fathers. But on 9-11, she gains a new nickname. She gains the nickname the Little Chapel that stood. Why? Well, as I said, those towers come down, that blast wave sets that huge dust cannon and all that force up the street, and it hits this old, old chapel. But it first hit a sycamore tree in the backyard of the chapel. But the tree fell in a way that protected the chapel from further harm. Despite all the carnage I described right down the road, only damage St. Paul suffered, one broken window pane. That's it. Just a single broken window. So if you believe in miracles, there's one for you right there. But that's not the only time she comes up in our story. Because now we have to transition to the cleanup. And cleanup is going to be very difficult and dangerous for a few reasons. Once 9-11 happens, it gains the name Ground Zero. That's how it becomes, quote, Ground Zero. And you have a giant pit at the center of the World Trade Center. The damage is so massive, they're looking at two years to clean up. Two years. Cell phones are down, not everyone has one. World Trade, if you're coming from abroad, part of the community In the weeks after 9-11, once the victim count was finalized, St. Paul's been Four big white panels. So they took it with photo of flowers and teddy bears. They needed over 100 panels when all was set up. Come on, sir. Come on. Before we can get to all of this, it's going to be difficult, as you might imagine, for a few reasons. One, it's going to be a lot of money to make new buildings we probably don't need. Two, did we not learn our lesson? Why are we going to make another big tower just to be a part? And three, and this is really the crux of it, it's sacred ground. This is the site of one of the worst things to ever happen in human history. There were still unidentified remains that get infused into the earth. We know all the victims, but it felt wrong to put anything new over the deaths. Over 1,500 families don't have remains of their loved ones. Over 1,500 families don't have remains of their loved ones. So they eventually declared no new commercial buildings would be built over the deaths, and anything new would be placed along the perimeter. And where the two towers stood, we have the two reflecting pools, which again, I will take you to later in the day. It is no longer a seven building complex. So what happens? May 2002, we have that empty crater, and now we start rebuilding. 
Building number seven is going to go up first in 2006, 52 stories. It went up so quickly, nobody died in building seven. That sacred ground went right back up where it stood. Building seven fell around 520 in the evening later that day. 2013, building number four goes up 72 stories. Most recently in 2018, building number three goes up 80 stories. Buildings and their heights. This is riveting, I know. But the reason I bring it up is because we're going to talk about buildings two, five, and six now. Building two would be next. It won't be a twin of the big one. It'll only be about 80 stories. And it's right here. Not really, at all, actually. Because clearly this is not an 80-story construction site. Because the reality is we have not built two, nor five, nor six. And the reason we haven't built them yet is because for those buildings, we don't have what's called an anchor tenant. An anchor tenant is a group company or person that will rent out a big chunk of office space in advance prior to making the building. Easy way to lose hundreds of millions of dollars by pumping all this money into an office and then nobody moves into work. So we need that assurance ahead of time. But if I'm being honest, unless we make these new buildings apartments, at least in some fashion, I don't think we're going to see them in my lifetime or their lifetimes. Because the reality is we don't need them. This is FIDI, Financial District. Investment bankers, Wall Street types were and are down here. All were with the big modems and monitors. What do you need today to run a company? Yeah, this and maybe a laptop. This could be my whole company right here. So we don't need the space, and we don't need the people. Something we're kind of learning with the whole working from home thing in the last few years. So I think especially because of what's gone down lately, we aren't going to see these new buildings unless they add apartments. But the one big tower that I've been teasing all tour long and we can finally talk about is that big one right down the road. Her cornerstone was placed in 2004 and she was finished 10 years later. Four stories tall. The old ones were 110. This is 104. But there's one critical change we made. And I want you to crank those knives back and peer through that sun reflecting off and look at the very top of the tower. And you're going to see a spire that is over 400 feet tall. Why do you think we stuck that spire there on the top of the tower? What do you think we're doing with that? What was that? To make it the technological improvements. You're dead wrong and she's closer, but thank you for paying attention. I appreciate that. No, honestly, the purpose of why it's there is because it brings the total height of the building to 1,776 feet tall. 1776. Year of our independence. So it wasn't enough to make a new big tower. We had to put a big middle finger on top to let the whole world know we're not going anywhere. And let me tell you, Chicago was pissed. Oh my goodness. So in Chicago, they have the Willis Tower, that's its name, but I use it in quotes because everyone just calls it the Sears Tower there. That became the tallest in the country. Then we built this sucker and just stuck a giant 400 foot spire on top and was like, hey, now it's the tallest. And they're like, no, you can't just do that to anything. There was a huge debate. The mayor was calling, taking shots in New York City. A 25 person committee got together and met for five hours behind closed doors to debate if that could be considered part of the building height. Eventually they declared it does, not just tallest in the country, but tallest in the Western Hemisphere. Go New York. And like the other Twin Towers, it's another modern miracle of construction. No building can withstand a commercial airliner. The only ones that can are called mountains. And we don't have those in New York. But instead, we made some key changes. One of those key changes, I cannot show you here, but I can show you like 25 steps in that direction. So watch the curb. We're going to cross the street, and I'll show you one of the major changes we made to the tower. The prop. It has a kind of blue, it's mostly blue, and then when you track your eyes down, the glass goes gray. It goes from blue to gray all at the bottom. The reason it's all gray at the bottom is because the tower is actually standing on a 190-foot concrete pedestal. The idea is that pedestal can absorb a blast from a bomb at street level or in the basement. Some of you may remember in 1993, a few months before I was born, there was a bombing in the basement of the Old World Trade Center. A few casualties, nothing like 9-11. We don't have a sad day typically in New York on its anniversary. But in theory, that pedestal can absorb the blast. There are cameras that can detect if I leave my backpack by itself for too long. The important addition is the addition of emergency stairwells. Let's rewind. I just told you all those towers boasted an open floor plan. Here's the problem. You have a jet wiping out your floor. You're wiping out the entire floor and thus all stairwells at plane level. All stairwells between both towers were destroyed at plane level except for one in the south tower. 90%, 9-0, 90% of all deaths in the towers happened at or above where the plane sits. Just 14, 1-4, one 14 people got out of a plane level in the south tower from that one stairwell. That's it. So it's a virtual death sentence, literally in the north tower, if you're above the plane. And those four flights, they were all headed out west. They were headed to the west coast. Reason? Longer the flight, more jet fuel in the tank, bigger the boom. They were used as bombs. Jet fuel burns at an insanely high temperature. That's what causes the steel beams of the tower to superheat, lose their integrity, and come down. 
The only good thing, if we can call it that, was that the towers came straight down. They didn't topple over like that. Had they fallen like that, the victim count's gonna soar, five to 10,000 plus, if not more. But luckily they came straight down. So they can test the different segments that did or did not work. Without them, that victim count is also gonna soar. There is no fire drill for this kind of event. They are so critical for that efficient evacuation. Another personal story, also from my hometown in Bergenfield, is a man named John Azero. Known in my entire life, he lived one street over from me. No dentist appointment that day, John's in the North Tower. Plane hits, John starts making his way down. He starts heading down the tower and he eventually comes across a gentleman who's heaving and wheezing, he's having trouble breathing. And he turns to me and he goes, buddy, I don't know you, but you're with me, let's go. Puts his arm around him, starts helping him down. They get down about 10 flights of stairs and the guy turns to me and he goes, John, God bless you, but I'm gonna kill you. You gotta let me go. John's like, no, we can do it, come on, come on. He's like, please, just sit me down. So John sits him down, continues down the tower. He eventually comes across a woman who twisted her ankle. And he says, lady, come on, we're going to an ambulance. I'm gonna get you some oxygen, let's go. Puts her arm around him, they start headed down. They head down, they make it to the bottom. They go outside, they find an ambulance. The towers come down. They're both alive to this day. A true hero. The steel core that rises up. And that steel core is surrounded by one meter thick of concrete. And inside that steel core is a double helix staircase. Think DNA, double helix. The idea is people can go down and up should we need it again. Problem, uh, there is nothing to do in downtown New York City. Unless you're going to the Statue of Liberty, or you're coming here to work, there's no reason to be here. New York, it's all Midtown, Broadway, Times Square, Central Park. So they were like, look, if we want people to come down here and honor 9-11, we need to give them things to do, reasons to come down here. And this is where the true rebuilding and the true beauty starts. And for our story, it's gonna start with this funky looking white building right here. And let me tell you, as we approach July and our summer months, there is no better metaphor in our country for a place of beauty and rebirth than by entering a structure with central air conditioning. Let's head inside and cool on down. This beautiful, magnificent white space was designed by famous Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava. And Calatrava is known for making buildings just like this one. Question for you, where are we getting our light source from? Yeah, the sun, natural light. Oculus is Latin for eye. Light flooding in. Calatrava makes big buildings with big windows all over the world. He has a museum in Milwaukee and a bridge in Dallas. And a train station in Portugal. I mean, he is known all over. Above you here is a blast proof skylight. And it's not a bunch of tiny window panes, it's just two big vertical window panes. And they open up. And your next question is, when do they open them? One day or... I don't need to tell you which day. From 8.46 to 10.28 a.m. Signify when we were born. But it's also letting in pure air, so we're not hermetically sealed off from the outside. Pure air coming at a premium that day, despite the beauty of the weather. And from the outside, it looked like a weird ribcage. What's going on with those spires? It's an abstract art image, and you'll see it better from one of the polar ends of the oculus, but it's supposed to be the wings of a dove being released from a child's hands. The dove, the white bird of peace in many cultures and religions. But a good-looking piece of architecture is not enough to galvanize New Yorkers to come down here. That's not going to summon the troops. This building serves a much more critical function. You are all currently standing in what is a part of New York City's third largest transportation hub. If any of you saw the Fulton Center across the street from when we first got here, that connects underground to here. If it was raining, it would have taken us under the tunnels. Prior to 9-11, transportation down here, god-awful nightmare. Oh my goodness, you couldn't get to all seven buildings, the subway lines were a mess, so they were like, look, if we want people to come down here to honor 9-11, they need to, you know, come down here quickly and easily. So between here and the Fulton Center, we now have access to 12, count them, 12 subway lines that can spit you out to all seven, which don't exist, buildings at the World Trade Center. Across the way there, you'll see it says PATH. They rebuilt the PATH train that runs to my old state of New Jersey. Instead of taking a train to Midtown and then subway down, $2.75 train ride right to the Garden State. And it goes all the way to Newark. Total capacity for this hub, 250,000 passengers a day. 250K a day. And those are numbers they projected for 2025. So they thought well ahead when they finished this in 2016. This is so critical. Without transportation, it all means nothing. 
but it's not just a place to travel, it's also a place to do a little shopping. So we're going to move to our next checkpoint. As we do, keep your eyes open at the different wares you can peruse, and we'll discuss further. We're going to head on down the stairs here, make a left head down. as you might imagine. So the main uh, anchor tenant, as I was saying, the anchor tenant of building one is Port Authority. Port Authority uh, of New York and New Jersey. So Port Authority, it's kind of what it sounds like. It was designed to be like a joint uh, kind of commission that runs and protects our ports between like New York and New Jersey, but now they do any kind of transportation. So down here we have the path that goes to New Jersey, therefore Port Authority, New York, New Jersey. It all connects. You'll see that Penn Station with New Jersey kind of, and then most importantly, the Port Authority bus terminal that goes back and forth. So they're kind of the main anchor tenant of building one. So they were responsible for a lot of the rebuilding. And then a lot of this was city money, some government money as well that they put aside to help, you know, reinvigorate. And then some of it was taxpayer money as well. So it was a lot of donations, uh, taxpayer, it was a big combination of it all. There was no uh, one singular donor or was it just all one government or wasn't all taxpayer completely. It was a healthy mix of everyone. And there was pushback, honestly, because then people were like, we don't really need all of this. Why are we gonna pay for all this to come down here? Uh, aside from the community. In fact, this building that we're in right now was seven years behind schedule, four billion to make. This whole area. Now this is we're talking the hub and the transportation, it's not just you know the fancy roof. But yeah, so a lot of people were like not happy. But then like most things in New York we complain and then we get over. But clearly we are inside a mall, obviously. It's a mall. Under the old World Trade Center we had New York City's largest mall, and now we have this mall here in its stead. And this mall is statistically the most ironic mall in all of North America. Why do I say that? Well, the old mall was designed for the everyday 9 to 5. You spill coffee in your shirt, you get a cheap button down, flowers for the secretary, quick sandwich. Nicest store at the old mall, like Banana Republic. What do we got here? Kate Spade. Stores I can't pronounce, that's how you know they're fancy. Two levels of an Apple store, I think it was like Macintosh back then, because who's the clientele, that bougie or techie side? And tourism. New York will always be expensive. People are coming down here, they will pay top dollar for the goods. But you might notice, a lot of these stores don't have many people walking in them despite how many people I said are designed to come through here. A lot of companies will just take the losses in their you know, retail sales and just use it as advertising. Because even if nobody buys that Kate Spade, hey, you're passing it, it's coming in great in your brain. So it's just kind of, not free marketing, but it's almost like extra marketing that you can get exactly at. Pictures, smartphones, all of it. But you'll probably notice up here, we have these projector lights, and they have little snowflakes on some of them. At Christmas time, They'll blast Christmas music, they project snowflakes and reindeer all over, they set up a whole winter village with Christmas trees, it looks awesome. And then January comes, and they take it down, it's the most depressing thing you've ever seen, and it's just empty and gray firehouse that we're going to walk to in a second. This is Ladder and Engine Company number 10, a fully functioning firehouse, was here on 9-11, was destroyed, has since been rebuilt. And this firehouse was the, very, was the home of the very first of the first responders. There were six firefighters on duty that day, all six of them perished. They didn't even need to wait for the call to come in. They probably heard the blast and got right to work. We honor their memory with a small bronze plaque right outside the garage there. And you'll see as we walk to it in a second, there is a 7,000 pound bronze plaque that honors all 343 firefighters who died defending the area right across the street. So we're gonna walk to the firehouse now. Feel free to walk the length of the plaque so you can take some photos. I'll call you over.
Just, that was able to survive because uh, because they came down, yeah, because the towers came straight down to help limit the damage, and because it was a seven building. destination, the 9-11 Memorial. These grounds were designed by a team, an Israeli-American architect named Michael Arad and a world-renowned landscaping artist named Peter Walker. And they titled these grounds Reflecting Absence, the cornerstones being the two reflecting pools and our museum. The museum goes about 70 feet down to almost the bedrock level of New York City. It's very vast and open. It feels like there's not a lot down there. It's designed that way, so you're not surrounded by the most intense images and artifacts. But there are two main rooms where it picks up in intensity. Be a little heavy but it's beautifully beautifully done i'm glad a lot of you are going over here this white building this is a greek orthodox church saint nicholas saint nicholas um it was finished in uh about late last year around november to december 2022 there were delays naturally because of covid but this was rebuilt because it was the only house of worship to be destroyed on 9 11. as much as we know saint paul survived 9 11 saint nicholas was not so fortunate so they wanted to rebuild this as the only house of worship so it can be fully restored and it does have services now. The designer of this building is a gentleman named Santiago Calatrava. Now what you know is who you know. The same gentleman who did the Oculus, designed St. Nicholas. But I really want to direct your attention to what's up here on the right. That golden sphere. So that sphere is called the sphere. Simply. It was designed by artist Francis Koenig and it sat at one of the main plazas of the World Trade Center. And Koenig designed it as a symbol of world commerce, world peace. And after 9-11, he wanted to destroy it because he felt like the symbol of unity failed. But a lot of New Yorkers pushed back. They said, no, 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 let's keep it. You can tell it's a sphere. It got beat up, but you can tell what it was. Let's keep it as a former Brazilian suit. So we moved it down south to Battery Park, and we brought it right back here when we finished the ground. One, one of the many reminders of life persevering that we have here at the site. I'm going to now take us inside the grounds proper. The only thing I ask is you don't drift off towards one of the pools too early. I'm going to give you some time to explore them in a second. Just stay with me and we'll head inside. We'll run a bit more. New Yorkers can go by. Uh, it's really cool. Yeah. Behind me here, you're going to see a path that people can walk down. And they are walking between slabs of concrete rising out of fields of adversity. And that is the path that is a memorial for all of those who have died since 9-11. All of the first responders and survivors who have died from lung cancers or other smoke-related illnesses. And that path was chosen very specifically. That is the same path that led down into the cleanup site over 21 years ago. Almost 22 now. So for many people, they're being honored at that path because they walk down those same steps. It took them until 2019, but Congress finally passed the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund in near perpetuity to all of those dealing with health-related effects to get the proper care that they deserve. Too long in my opinion, but I guess better late than never, John Stewart, the comedian, is spearheading that effort here in New York and D.C. But on a much lighter note, you probably noticed we got a few trees on the grounds. The old World Trade Center had like a dozen trees. That's it. New York is not the nature city of America. You don't come here for the hiking. It's like Central Park, end of list. And what do we have here? We have 400 trees. 
and the tree we have chosen to plant is the swamp white oak. Why do we choose this tree? A few reasons. One, I'm a drummer. Oak drumsticks are some of the strongest drumsticks for strong and durable wood. Two, they're going to grow 60, 70 feet tall. So when our younger friends come back with your families years from now, they'll be surrounded in a literal forest. And three, they're going to last two to three hundred years. So long after we're gone, they're going to be here giving life. Because with our trees, they are life. They're giving us oxygen. 400 trees giving us that life to breathe. And as a bonus, you can find a swamp white oak in New York City, Washington, D.C., and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. A beautiful trip. Now that said, there is one tree that is pretty clearly not a swamp white oak. It is obviously the that one. Obviously, yeah. So that right there is a calorie pear tree. Calorie pear. Story goes, there was a calorie pear tree about 20 yards from here on 9-11. Worst spot you could be, it gets covered. Weeks go by, they're going through the rubble. And they find it. And it's exactly as you would imagine. The bark is simply and burnt, the limbs are shorn, the branches are snapped. But on one of the twigs, there were a few green leaves. Green, that verdant, natural color of life. And it became kind of a New York legend. So when they were doing the grounds here, they said, let's plant a calorie pear tree here. And this tree is nicknamed the survivor tree. And it honors the original in a very special way. It honors the original by being the original tree that they found. That's the same one, not a metaphor. She wasn't expected to last the winter. They took her to a nursery in the Bronx, restored her. And here she is 21 years later, right back where she belongs. And I've given a tour the first week of December when these are all bare and she's still a crimson orange. And she's the first tree that goes green every spring. Anytime there's a natural disaster or a shooting in our country, we'll donate seedlings from that pear tree to those cities so they can plant their own if they wish and begin the healing. A beautiful testament to that reaffirmation of life. And then finally, we have our pools. Behind us here is the South Pool. This is where the South Tower stood. And a little later, I'll take us to the North Pool where the North Tower stood. These are the one acre footprints of the Twin Towers, but it's not the pool itself. It's that first set of trees along the perimeter. So when you cross that tree line, you are stepping into the shadow of what was each of the Twin Towers. Now I'm gonna flip the world. I invite you all to just take a few seconds, close your eyes, take a slow, deep breath, and just listen. What is water? It's life and purity. We need it to live. The flowing water is harder to paint, harder to play. And it's relaxing. People listen to the sound of flowing water all the time to go to bed or calm your mind. This is not a cemetery. It is designed to be a place where you can sit on a stone, read a book, take a walk, calm your mind. These are the largest man-made waterfalls in North America. The first drop goes down 30 feet, and there's a second drop in the center, and that one is bottomless, like our Greek. You can't see the bottom. Beneath the panels is a little pool of water. That's always there. If you want to make a physical connection with that reaffirmation of life, you can touch that water. And I ask you, what did you hear? When you're right next to them, what are you not going to hear? The city. You don't hear the sirens, the horns, Jacqueline giving her tour. It'll just be you and your thoughts. And then on the panels, we have names. If a name is embossed up, it is the name of a group or a company, Ladder Company 10, United 93. And if it's etched down, it's the name of a person. On the North Pool yonder, we have the North Tower victims, the North Plain, and the 93 bombing. And on the South Pool here, we have the South Tower victims, the South Plain, Pentagon, Pentagon Plain, United 93, and our first response. You will notice the names are not in alphabetical order. They are arranged in a beautiful way called meaningful adjacencies. It took them a year to plan, and families could make submissions, but they keep people together that had a connection. The Plain victims were kept together. Hey, these two always got a beer every Friday after work. Let's keep them together. Oh, they would love that, absolutely. There are stories of people meeting at the panels for the first time because they knew two friends or they knew the same victim. I've seen it happen. It's awesome. And finally, if you see a white rose sticking out of someone's name, wish them a happy birthday. And every morning they take out the old roses and put up fresh ones. So now I'm going to give you a few minutes to not necessarily pay respect, but just to be at peace, explore the pool here. Just ask you don't go too far in either direction, and in a few minutes we'll call you back, and we'll head to our finale. Enjoy.
there's freezing temperature, uh, they will actually turn off the waterfalls. Clearly that is not the case today. Um, now, when it gets super windy, actually this specific side will become like sea world when the water comes up. Now in the winter it's awful. Summer day it feels like it's great. But as you can feel right now, that is also not the case today. So there is some third reason why they are turning off the waterfall that I'm not too sure about. It may have something to do with the construction that's going on behind. But that's kind of doubtful because it's been going on for a few years. So I'm not exactly sure why they are turning off the fountain, unless there's some technical issue. But at least we got to have that experience with the South Sea. However, I end every tour here regardless because I have one final personal story to give you. Because right where this family is taking a group photo, there's panel N51. And there's a name on the bottom center of that panel, Richard Joseph Cadena, and that belongs to my Uncle Richie. My Uncle Richie was on the 105th floor of the North Tower. He worked for a company called Canner Fitzgerald, a company that got decimated on 9-11. They lost over 650 employees that day. His brother, my father, was working in a town called Fort Lee, New Jersey. It's the last city in Jersey before New York. And my dad was at, saw the South Tower get hit through binoculars in his office with no way of reaching his brother in the North Tower. His wife, my Aunt Georgia, who's still alive today, we just saw a play last Sunday, has just a 14 second voicemail that's just coughing. It's just coughing for 14 seconds. They were able to identify the charred cash that they found in his pan pocket because all they found was a leg through DNA testing. They put the cash in a police bag, gave it to my aunt. After 20 years, she said, I don't need this anymore. Do we want with it? I'm gonna throw it out. Instead of throwing it out, I contacted the museum. We went back and forth. And around the 20th anniversary, they accepted it as part of their collection of artifacts on rotation in the museum. So if you go inside, there's a chance you might see a piece of my uncle. But I bring up my Uncle Richie, not just because he's my connection, but he's what this place is designed to be. He'd be really upset right now. We're not all smoking a cigar and doing a shot off his name in his honor. And he'd be like, but they're not 21. He'd be like, yeah, but they're from England. They don't have a drinking age. It's fine. He was the funny uncle. We were joking that he'd be surfing down the tower. And there's a rumor that a prayer circle broke out at Canner. One of the employees actually got through to their loved one and said, it's OK. The guy leading us is really funny. He gives nicknames to all of his coworkers. That was our uncle. We feel like it had to have been him. And he is what this place is meant to be. How did we enter this park? We did this. Walked in. No payment, no security. You can enter from any side. It's designed to be a human magnet. A place where you can come, hold hands, take a selfie, enjoy the day. We say never forget, but it's never stop moving. Never stop being yourself. I've given a tour here, and I've seen a couple making out on the side of one of the pools. Now what we're going for when I say that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for behaving back there. I appreciate it. I've seen someone walking their dog screaming curse words, and I'm not being funny. I swear this happened. I gave a tour on Halloween, and I saw the Joker paying his respects by one of the names. Weirdest thing I've ever seen. Batman Joker looking sad at the 9-11 memorial. But that's New York. We are a weird city. Never forget, but never stop moving. This behind me, it's almost done. It's going to be a gorgeous performing arts center. I hope to play there one day. This is how you bring life to the area, because now we have an arts center, a park, a museum, transportation. Now more restaurants can open up, thank God, because there's nowhere to eat between my tours. This is how you bring life. But I'll tell you what, folks, for all my talk today about the dove and the trees and the water and the oxygen, it all means nothing if people don't show up. And that's what you're doing now. You're not doing a tour or anything. You're helping us grow. You're helping us heal. And if there's only one thing you take away from our adventure today, it's that New York is not the city that doesn't sleep. We're the city that doesn't quit. We didn't quit yesterday. We're not going to quit today. And 21 years later, after a pandemic, people are still showing up. Tomorrow doesn't look good either. And as someone deeply connected, I thank you for checking out our part of the country.